Hello and greetings from the Jefferson County Historical Commission. My name is Lee Catherine Goldstein and I'm the chair of the Historical Commission. The JCHC, as we call the Historical Commission for short, is a group of volunteers who are appointed by the Board of County Commissioners for Jefferson County for the purpose of promoting and preserving our county's rich heritage. For 16 years, it has been our pleasure to host a historic preservation symposium, which highlights different aspects of our county's rich history. This year, with the COVID-19 pandemic, which of course itself is a historic event, we've had to change things up a bit. We've had to change our in-person event to a virtual format. So this year will be our 17th Annual Historic Preservation Symposium and our first ever virtual symposium. Our 2020 Virtual Historic Preservation Symposium consists of three video presentations on very different aspects of Jefferson County history. We will be releasing one video a week for three consecutive weeks and they will be available on our YouTube channel. Our first presentation concerns the ever entertaining topic of bootleggers, moonshiners, and speakeasies, the Prohibition era in Jefferson County. This will be presented by John Steinley, one of our JCHC members. Our second video will talk about Cement Bill Williams and the creation of the Lariat Loop Trail, which is also known as the Lookout Mountain Road. This will be presented by Jefferson County Open Space Education Specialist, Andrea Keppers. And finally, our third video will be focused on the women's suffrage movement uh, in a presentation called Votes for Women, How Colorado Led the Way, presented by our JCHC member, Bonnie Scudder. So before we begin our videos, I want to give a quick shout out to the members of the Jefferson County Historical Commission and the staff who help us bring history to life. The current members of the Jefferson County Historical Commission are Steve Engel, Rick Gardner, Carla Opp, Bonnie Scudder, Dick Scudder, Cynthia Shaw, and John Steinley. We also have an outgoing member, PJ Jones, who I want to mention because she has been the editor for the 2019 and 2020 Historically Jeffco magazine. I also want to mention our emeritus members who are people who have been nominated for an honorary membership status due to their significant contributions to the work of the Historical Commission and the preservation of the history of Jefferson County. These are Deborah Andrews, Bob Briggs, Nina Kite, Rose Lewis, Mary Lindsay Hepp, Stan Moore, David Nelson, Caitlin Ordway, Rita Peterson, Millie Roeder, and Badette Weir. I also want to thank and mention our county staff uh, who support the JC and all of the work, the JCHC and all of the work that we do. So we have Brittany Gatta, Justin Montgomery, Renee Hansen. All three of these folks work with the Planning and Zoning Department for Jefferson County. And I also want to give a special thanks to the Director of Planning and Zoning, Chris O'Keefe, for his con continued support of our work. And now, Sit back, relax, and join us as we present the 17th Annual Jefferson County Historic Preservation Symposium. Hello again from the Jefferson County Historical Commission. Did you know that during the Prohibition era, Jefferson County was home to backwoods, stills, roadhouses, and speakeasies? Well, you may want to grab your beverage of choice for this first presentation by JCHC member John Steinley as he talks about bootleggers, moonshiners, and speakeasies, the Prohibition era in Jefferson County. To give you a little background, John's career has centered on history. He received a master's degree in museum and archival management from Wright State University, then worked as a curator and archivist at the Cincinnati Art Museum and the Cincinnati Historical Society. He then served as director at several Ohio museums before emigrating to Colorado in 1992. 
In 1994, John became the administrator of the Haiwan Homestead Museum in Evergreen, Colorado, working for Jefferson County Open Space. He was promoted to history education supervisor and supervisor for the Bear Creek region. He retired in 2016, at which time we were delighted to have him join the Jefferson County Historical Commission. John has authored several books on local history, including a book on Evergreen and Conifer. Take it away, John. Well, hello everyone. My name's John Steinley, and I'm a member of the Jefferson County Historical Commission. And I'll be leading you today through this little magical history tour concerning bootleggers, moonshiners, and speakeasies the Prohibition Era in Jefferson County. And here's to you. Now you may have noticed that I'm drinking out of an antique beer bottle. And that's true, this is over a hundred years old. And this bottle came from the Steinle Brewery in Delphos, Ohio. So yes, part of my family had a brewery up in Northern Ohio. My grandfather had a saloon in my hometown. And one of my ancestors had a tavern on the Cincinnati waterfront way back over 200 years ago. So I, I feel I'm well qualified to lead you on this tour dealing with guzzling bootleg hooch. Back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, saloons were seen as dens of vice because that's where the men congregated with their buddies after a 10 or 12 hour shift at work and drink liquor, whiskey, beer, uh, gamble, play cards, smoke cigars, cuss, and do all the other things that men just naturally like to do. But there was also a factor there, uh, in, especially in the western mining towns where often the saloons were connected with prostitution also. And so these men would be there uh, spending their meager wages on liquor and beer and other pursuits while they should be spending that money on their families. And this bothered a lot of people. So during the late 1800s, a lot of organizations formed to oppose the local neighborhood saloon and the sale of liquor. Uh, among the Crusaders were the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Anti-Saloon League. And those were both lobbying organizations that just grew more and more powerful as time went on because alcoholism at that time was as great a scourge as the opioid epidemic is today. And over time, they were joined by Crusaders like powerful politicians, William Jennings Bryan, for example, and also the very popular evangelist, Billy Sunday. They were all crusading and joining together to try to eliminate the local neighborhood saloon and the sale of liquor and enforce prohibition in many different ways. So the legislature here in Colorado passed a prohibition law that was to go into effect on January 1st, 1916 when the entire state would go dry. And that night in Denver was very quiet, as the newspapers reported, but not here in Jefferson County. In Golden, about 10 o'clock at night, fights broke out in the local saloons, and uh, it spilled out into the streets and to the point where it began as a riot that night. And a lot of men got their heads busted, there were a lot of black eyes and quite a few ended up in the jail in Golden. So it was a riotous beginning to prohibition in Jefferson County. And that was kind of emblematic of how it was going to all work out here in Jeffco during the prohibition era. We weren't exactly going to be a law-abiding bunch of people. Now, when you talk about prohibition, what businesses are most likely to, to go into bankruptcy? And of course, the answer would be breweries and distilleries. But that didn't happen here in Jefferson County because Coors adapted very quickly to the demands of the Prohibition era. Uh, they did a lot of things to circumvent the Prohibition laws. For instance, they got into uh, ceramics production. They bought a ceramics factory in Golden, and that is still in operation today as Coors Tech. 
Uh, they also branched out into real estate and they produced glassware and they also produced malted milk products and that was very important because they started selling a lot of malted products to the Moore, uh, sorry, the Mars Candy Company and that ended up the Mars Bar. But they also sold packets of malt extract. Now what happens when you combine malt extract with water and yeast? Hmm, you might just end up with homebrew beer. And so uh, Coors sold millions and millions of these packets of homebrew, uh, basically kits, and that's one of the reasons that they were able to survive the Prohibition era and even prosper during that time period. Now I should mention that the national crusade for prohibition went on and intensified even after Colorado went dry. So by 1920 there was enough influence by the different lobbying organizations that, uh, and, and by the way, they had the prohibition crusade had joined with the women's suffrage crusade. So in 1920, the constitutional amendments were passed for women's suffrage and also for prohibition and the whole country went dry. So federal law enforcement was added to state and local law enforcement to try, I emphasize try, to enforce prohibition in Jefferson County. Now there were ways to get around the prohibition laws and one of them was a loophole that allowed, allowed clergymen to buy sacramental wine and use those in religious ceremonies. So what happened was at the Shrine of St. Anne in Arvada, Father Walter Grace, very appropriately named, um, managed to circumvent the law by buying large quantities of sacramental wine and then selling it under the table to his parishioners. Now the feds uh, caught wind of this, went after Father Grace, and he had to flee. They estimated maybe he went to Chicago to get away from them, leaving an unpaid bill at Daniels and Fisher of $525. Father Grace, you are not only a bootlegger, you're also a deadbeat. Now one of the things that happened during Prohibition was that roadhouses were established at different remote locations all around Jefferson County. Roadhouses could be anything from a shack with a makeshift bar set up inside to a very elaborate uh, establishment with uh, a bar, pool tables, slot machines, dance music, all kinds of things happening there and these roadhouses were all over the place all over Jefferson County and were frequently raided by the law enforcement officials here. Now you can visit and see one of the surviving roadhouses in Jefferson County on Easley Road in Golden. And this was the Golden Chateau when it opened in 1926 as one of the many roadhouses scattered all across the county, probably one of the nicer ones. And today it is the clubhouse for the Golden Elks Club. Now one of the other things that happened was speakeasies were established also in the more urban areas of the county and they were usually more elaborate. They would have a very nice bar and they would have a great selection of liquor and beer. They would have pool tables, they would have slot machines, they would have dance music and a dance floor and a lot of times you had to have a password in order to enter. Joe sent me. So these are the kinds of places that were scattered all over the place. Now the Silver State Club uh, speakeasy in Wheat Ridge was raided by the feds and local officials and there were 25 bootleggers gathered there by a guy named Pete Carlino who was one of the leading bootleggers in Pueblo. And he was trying to establish an Al Capone style cartel of selling liquor all around the Denver area. There was no liquor at this meeting, so the men could only be arrested for vagrancy and quickly released. And that was the end of that attempt to create the Al Capone type empire in Jefferson County. Now there were lots of loopholes in the prohibition law, the Volstead Act. And one of the loopholes was if you could get a doctor's prescription for medicinal whiskey, you could go to the local pharmacy, enter the prescription to the pharmacist, and he would dispense whiskey to you. 
and the different distilleries actually established their own medicinal brands of liquor to be distributed through pharmacies. And it was easy, probably, to get a doctor to write one of these prescriptions for you. I'm not saying that doctors would do illicit things, but hypothetically, you could slip them a few bucks and they would write you a prescription for some medicinal whiskey. And one of the places in Evergreen where this very often happened was Prince McCracken's Drugstore along Main Street and Evergreen. And that was known as a legal speakeasy where you could go in with a doctor's prescription and get a nice dose of whiskey. So it's very appropriate that liquor was sold there because guess what this building is today? It's the notorious Little Bear Biker Bar in Evergreen and they're still selling liquor at that same location. Now, moonshiners, let's talk about moonshiners. Everybody and anybody in Jefferson County apparently was a moonshiner making their own whiskey and beer back during the 1920s, especially in the unincorporated areas of western Jefferson County. Uh, almost every rancher or farmer seemed to have a still located somewhere off in the woods in a remote part of his property where it was difficult to find. And some of these establishments, these stills were enormous and that was illustrated when Sheriff Johnson and his deputies raided a moonshine still that was located about six miles west of Conifer. This was a huge establishment. They had three 150 gallon stills. They confiscated 65 gallons of whiskey and 10,000 gallons of mash. So this will give you an idea of the scale of moonshining that was going on in Jefferson County during Prohibition. Now during the Prohibition era, Jefferson County became so notorious for the sale of bootleg and illegal liquor that in 1930 the Rocky Mountain News published an editorial saying certain kinds of people should not be allowed into Denver. One group was residents of Adams County. They said Adams County was the center of poverty and foreclosures. And the other one was citizens of Jefferson County because Jeffco was so notorious for bootlegging, moonshining, roadhouses, and speakeasies, we were just a detestable bunch of people here in Jefferson County, and we shouldn't be allowed into a respectable place like Denver. Jefferson County was not just important in law breaking during Prohibition. It was also very important in law enforcement. And one of the key figures in that was John C. Vivian of Golden. John Vivian was a kingmaker in Republican politics. He was one of the most important Republican politicians in the entire state. And he was appointed by the federal government to be in charge of prohibition enforcement all throughout Colorado and Wyoming. He was a regional prohibition official. So he was very important in enforcing the prohibition laws and he did it very energetically. Unfortunately, in 1931, he was forced to resign because one of his agents killed a young teenager during an arrest attempt. This was a big scandal and Vivian was forced out of office as a prohibition official. Now the top law enforcement official in Jefferson County during most of the 1920s and the Prohibition era was Sheriff Walter Johnson. Walter Johnson was part of one of the oldest families of Golden. They had owned the old Cold Spring Ranch from way back in the 1860s located about where Camp George West is today. And his family had been involved in law enforcement for a long time. So Sheriff Johnson was very energetic in enforcing the prohibition laws and one of the photos here that is shown is a still that he confiscated from some moonshiners in Jefferson County and it was uh, waiting at the sheriff's office downtown Golden to be destroyed. Unfortunately, Sheriff Johnson also got into some hot water. Uh, he was accused of being in collusion with the bootleggers and he was uh, subject of a grand jury investigation. Uh, fortunately for him, the chief witness against him was murdered 
uh, by bootleggers when apparently they learned he was going to give states evidence so Sheriff Johnson was never tried due to lack of evidence and it's still up in the air whether he really was in collusion with bootleggers and moonshiners or whether he was being framed by them because he'd been so energetic in pursuing the prohibition laws. Now there were lots of supporters of prohibition. Uh, not everybody was a lawbreaker, not everybody was in sympathy with repeal of prohibition. And one group that was very much in support and tried to enforce prohibition on their own was the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan was extremely powerful in Colorado during the 1920s, the Prohibition era, and the photo that is being shown here is one of their big meetings on Sunday nights up on top of South Table Mountain in Golden, where they rented an old nightclub up there and dance hall uh, for their local headquarters. And very often when they had those meetings up there, they would burn a huge cross up there on top of South Table Mountain, which could be seen around the whole area reminding people that the invisible empire, the Ku Klux Klan, was watching you. Now there were many charitable organizations that also supported prohibition. And one of the strongest groups like that was the Salvation Army. Now Evangeline Booth was the daughter of General William Booth who had started up the Salvation Army in England and she was the head of the Salvation Army here in the United States. And here's what she had to say about prohibition. She said, it is wonderful, wonderful, if it should take 50 years to get liquor entirely out of the country, obliterated from the streets, washed from the cellars, it would be a thousand times worth the effort. The achievement of prohibition in a country organized as this one is one of the greatest accomplishments of history. Think of the many today who never had 50 cents in their hands, who now have bank accounts. Think of the many women who never received a cent from their husband's wages since all the money went into the rich brewer's till, who now have a regular amount to spend for themselves and their children. Why, if everyone else fought to keep prohibition away, the thousands of reformed drunkards and inebriates would fight to keep it here. So the Salvation Army and many other charitable organizations felt that prohibition was an elevation of the level of society, it eliminated many evils, and it should really be enforced and remain. By the early 1930s, most Americans were sick of prohibition. It encouraged everyday citizens to become criminals. It encouraged the growth of organized crime. People like Al Capone and the Small Doan family right here in Denver were criminals who took advantage of prohibition. And it just disrupted society and law enforcement was obviously a failure trying to cover the whole country and enforce the prohibition laws. Also, we were in the Great Depression and the resumption of production at distilleries and breweries would help alleviate the terrible national curse when almost 25% of the workforce was unemployed. So in the 1932 presidential election, the Republicans still supported prohibition. And they were rooted in a lot of rural areas where people there were for prohibition, but the urban center Democrats led by Franklin Delano Roosevelt supported repeal of prohibition. And so the result, as we all know, was FDR and the Democrats won the election in a landslide. And one of the first things that FDR did when he got into office in March of 1933 was to sign a law allowing for the sale of 3-2 beer and light wines. And afterwards, supposedly, he said, after he signed it, I think it's time for a beer. So. The process of repealing prohibition went forward in Congress. They ratified the 21st Amendment to the Constitution, which repealed the 18th Amendment uh, authorizing prohibition. And it went through the ratification process by the states. Finally, on December 5th, 1933, Utah became the last state to authorize repeal of prohibition. 
and prohibition was gone. It was a failed experiment. It was a noble experiment, but it failed. <laughs>